All right, now let's go to uh, Revelation. And um, I, rem- I, I had forgot that I was going to, um, that I was going to uh, mention some things about the blood this morning that I brought up last Sunday and forgot all about it. And the Lord hit me on the head with it on the way over this morning. And I went, I remember that now. So what I want to do is uh, Revelation chapter 1. Um, I mentioned this um, and started talking about this last Sunday that there was uh, a controversy and, and still is. Uh, so as far as I know, the, the pastor, brother, Pastor Brown, that brought up this issue about the blood um, several years ago, as far as I know, he's still alive and still teaching that same heresy. In fact, the Bible college that he teaches at has defended him and stood up for him. And, and what I think is heresy because he is denying the blood as being essential for salvation. And he basically says that the blood doesn't mean blood. It means the death of Christ. And so you can have the death of Christ without the blood of Christ. And every time in the Greek, it says, and, and I'm going to show you something here in a little bit. I, there's a verse I was trying to quote last Sunday and I was getting it wrong. But I'm going to show it to you this morning. Um, this is how doctrines get changed is you make the Greek say something that's not obviously there. And let me show you what I mean by that. Um, revelation chapter one, let's pick it up in verse four, John to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him, which is. And which was and which is to come from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, those of you who have the King James Spirit Bible search software, since most of you, in fact, all of you are at home today, load up that software, type in the phrase, his own blood. You'll find that it's in the King James Bible exactly four times. Four is the number for the spiritual realm. It is the number for the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, it is also the number for a false gospel, the opposite of the true gospel of God. So that phrase, there's, there's power in these words. And this is what I like about my King James Bible is that God connects these things together by the words that he says. And if you change the words in any one verse, you're going to alter some major doctrines. So just that phrase, his own blood, you'll find it in there four times. And in every time it's referencing the blood of Jesus Christ and it's the part that it plays in our salvation. So he has washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his father. And to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, the first place we find that, Acts chapter 20, and I want you to turn your Bible there and I'll give you the context of Acts chapter 20. Um, Acts chapter 20, Paul is sort of um, nearing the end of, of his earthly ministry and he's sort of giving out like his last will and testament but he's giving out a stern warning of what's going to happen after he leaves and what paul said was right when paul ministered to the churches in galatia and he established those churches up there when he left that area grievous wolves entered in not sparing the flock and they brought in their Hebrew roots, Jewish theocracy, heresy, that basically said you had to, if you were going to be saved, you had to follow the Old Testament law in order to be saved or to remain saved. So it happened exactly the way Paul said it. Every time he left to work, grievous wolves moved in. So in Acts chapter 20, verse, uh, let's pick it up in verse 26. Wherefore, I take you to record this day, that I am pure from the blood of all men. Verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare unto you 
all the counsel of God. Paul said, I haven't hid anything. We don't, we don't hide. In Bible Christianity, we do not hide our doctrines. We don't hide what we believe. We don't have secret conclaves that nobody can participate in where we talk about the real doctrines that we believe. But we can't share that outside of these walls here. We don't do that. Everything that we know and everything that we believe is recorded right here in this book. And there's not other books up in heaven with more doctrines in it that God can't release to us yet. That is a lie. And there's a lot of people telling that lie too. Uh, so anyway, in verse 27, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. To all my pastor friends and to all the, I would say all the husbands. The flock of God that God has given you is your family or the flock of God is your church. God calls us men, as wicked and hell-deserving as we are, God calls us men to be overseers of the flock that he has given us. And it is a great responsibility. One of the things that God really dealt with me about years ago was, and I'll just kind of back up, and I've shared some of this before, but in my youth, I was pastoring a little church just south of here. And in my arrogance, I said, Mike, you could probably pick your church. You could probably pick whatever church you want. You're talented enough. You have the speaking ability. You have the music ability. You could probably get a big church, take over that church and have an easy ride. That's what I thought. But there was a reason why God wasn't letting me do that. Number one, there was a lot of things he had to break me of. And I mean a lot of things. My pride and arrogancy was at the top of the list. And number two, God had to show me that in his word, that one of the qualifications for a bishop is that he is to be the husband of one wife and he's to raise his family well. That means he's to do a good job of raising his family. Because if he cannot raise and manage a family, he's not qualified to be an overseer over the house of God. And that's something that I did not see until God worked it in me years later. But then when God dealt with me about the church that he had given me, and I mean this church. He said, Mike, this is a gift that I've given you. I can take it away from you if I want. It's my call. And I mean, God really was hammering me with that. And he said, it's your responsibility to watch over this flock and to take care of them. Now, I'm going to preach this morning. God's laid a message on my heart. And I'm really struggling with the message. I have a lot of scriptures, but I'm struggling with how I'm going to preach it. But it's about walls and the necessity of walls and building walls to protect what is most precious to us. So this idea applies to pastors. It applies to the husbands of, and, the, and the heads of families. God has given you that flock. You are an overseer over that flock and you are responsible for them. It's a big responsibility. So he said over the which, back in verse 28, over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God. Notice this, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now notice, follow the phrase here. To feed the church of God. He does not say the church of Christ. He does not say the church of Jesus. He says the church of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his, God, own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood. So the idea that the blood of Christ was not divine is a lie. Because it says right here that God has blood. Let me just ask you this. 
Does God have eyes? Yeah. Noah found grace in them. Does God have an arm? Yes. Does God have feet? Yes. Does God have a head? Yes. Does he have a face? Yes. Does he have a back? Yes. Moses got to see that part of it, couldn't see the rest of it. So God, in Christ, purchased the church with his own blood. Exact words that he used here in Revelation. Has washed us from our sins in his own blood. Boom. Purchased with his own blood. Now, here's what the exalted Greek professors, and I, I know that, and, and again, I'm, I'm rooting for John MacArthur to win his battle in California for their right to continue to have church. I don't want to lose ours, even though we've kind of made everybody stay home because we've had serious issues with COVID in this church. But it's our decision whether we're going to be here or not. It's our choice, not the government. And so, um, but I, John MacArthur has at least, and I know at one time, espoused this same idea. That it's not the blood of Christ, it's the death of Christ. And in that, he is wrong. Now here's what they do. It, they said, to feed the church of God, with, which he has purchased with his own blood. They say the phrase, which he has purchased with his own blood, the way the Greek is laid out, it really implies with the blood of his son. So they, even though those words, his son, is not in the Greek text anywhere. Doesn't, it's not there. They say the flow of the Greek and the Greek, the way you parse this verb and the way you do this and you, you turn it this way and, and you twist it a few times and wring it out. And then it, what it really should have said is he has bought it with the blood of his own son. So they add, they don't like the verse because it disagrees with their theology, their trumped up theology. So they just make the Greek say something that it never said. That's how you do it. And I know this because I did it years ago. And thank God, God brought me out of that with a very heavy rod. And I don't do that no more. I don't put words in God's mouth. I don't take words out of God's mouth, out, out of context. The church was purchased with God's own blood. And that's the end of the story. And he said, verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Uh, let me keep reading. Also of your own selves, of your own selves, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Why do some people make themselves YouTube channels? Why do people do that? Okay. Because YouTube allows them to make money off of everything they put on YouTube. If they can get you to watch it, they get a check. And some people, some people have quit their jobs. They don't work a job anymore. They make YouTube videos for a living and they do quite well with it. Okay. But what are they doing? They're making disciples unto themselves. We, this church, I, do not ever monetize any of our YouTube videos. We're given the choice on every one that we upload. And I always click no to the monetization. I don't want to get into the idea that if I say certain things, more people will watch it and we'll get more money out of it. That's not how it works. God's against that. God hates that. But that's what people are doing. Uh, Peter talked about the false prophets. And he said they shall because of their, uh, because of their uh, covetousness. They shall with feigned words make merchandise of you. They literally sold you on the idea. You believed what they said. And they got paid well for it. 
And that's all the flat earth people and all the Hebrew roots people and everybody else that spreads false doctrine over the internet, especially on YouTube. I guarantee you they're doing it for the money. This Bible's right. But anyway, he said, of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of two years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now, go to uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Here's the third place, the phrase, his own blood is used. And you're going to see that absolutely, the blood is absolutely necessary for the salvation of man's uh, souls to wash away man's sins. They must be washed and cleansed with Christ's blood. Now, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ, and he's comparing the Old Testament law with New Testament law. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but here it is, by his own blood. By his own blood. You see, in the day of redemption, day of atonement, the high priest went in with the blood of a lamb or a goat and he dipped hyssop in that blood, sprinkled it before the mercy seat seven times and that atoned for the sins of Israel for one whole year. It's like a subscription. They had to renew it. They had to renew it every year. Had to keep doing it. They even had daily sacrifices similar to that one. But Christ... Because he offered his own blood and not the temporary blood of bulls and calves and goats and lambs. With his own blood, he has entered into the most holy place of the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. Somebody say amen. Boy, I wish I had a room full of people here. And he said, um, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You see, the blood of bulls and goats and calves, they might cover the sin, but they cannot atone for it. They cannot pay for it. And it cannot clear your conscience. Now, I know things that I've done. I never talk about them, and I'm not going to. You don't either. The things I've done and the things you've done. You don't talk about them. You don't have to. But one thing I know is that those sins have been washed by the blood of the everlasting Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Man, amen. So, that's how, our, how come our conscience can be purged from those dead works. We have a new knowing now, a new conscience. Whereas we knew that we had sinned, but now we know that those sins have been covered and God will, will not ever hold them against us. Ever, ever, ever. Somebody say amen. So with verse um, uh, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. When does a will and testament come into force? When a person dies. Can they be enforced before the person dies? No. We have to wait on this literal, historical fact to happen. That the person who testifies in a testament and signs his will, 
that on the fact of his death, now the testament is of force. So Christ has died. He's fulfilled the obligations of the old covenant. And now he, he is, rises again and we rise with him to be co-inheritors with him of the blessings that God promised him. Um, verse 16, for where testament is, this must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise is, is it no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats and, and water with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you moreover he sprinkled the blood he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry and almost all things are by the law purged with blood not death with blood with what blood divine blood God's own blood his, we, have, we are not redeemed with corruptible things, but incorruptible by the blood of Jesus Christ is how we're redeemed. Uh, verse 21, moreover, he sprinkled with the blood, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Something better than a little lamb or a goat or a bull had to die. And it was God's only begotten son, his divine son. The Son of God is God. Amen. It, and then one more. Four times, remember, His own blood. Hebrews 13, turn there. It says, we have an altar. And this, you know, I was always taught and heard, we call these benches here the altar. I don't get too nitpicky about it, but the truth of it is the altar for us is the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. That was the altar of sacrifice. So we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which served the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. There it is. Sanctified the people with his own blood. Suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. I've preached this many times. I've left the camp. I walked away from... A denomination walked away from men that I revered and looked up to. I walked away from things that I used to believe that I don't believe anymore because the Bible said something different. And if you want God's blessing, we follow Christ like the scapegoat. Once the sins were laid upon the head of that scapegoat, he was sent outside the city. That so that the sins are taken away from us. And we follow Christ going without the city, leaving the camp behind. Because if they won't serve God, and listen to me now. If your church won't serve God the right way, according to this book, you have no alternative but to step out and walk away. And come out, come out of them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Even if our own family members turn away from the gospel, we have to leave them. Pray for them, yearn for them, night and day. Pray that God will bring them back. 
God can bring back lost sheep. He can bring back prodigal children, prodigal fathers, prodigal wives. God can do it all. But you don't follow them in their sins. You don't say, well, I, I'm, in order to keep peace, I'll just go with them and do what they're doing. I've seen people try it. It don't work. It never works. So we bear the reproach of Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't have time to do this now, but very quickly, when he says, washed us in his blood, I do this teaching on the white blood cells. When, when blood is applied to my clothes, it's red, right? But in this case, we also have part of our blood called white blood cells. Right now, in my body, my body is fighting off some kind of infection in my throat, in this lung, in my sinuses, okay? And what's happening is the white blood cells in my blood are doing three things. They're, it's called engulfment where they cover over the infection completely. The white blood cells, the bones produce the white blood cells. That's how they tell somebody sick. They do a white blood cell count. And if their blood cell count is high, they know there's an infection there. So they, the white blood cells try to cover over the thing that is unclean in your body, whether it's a germ or some kind of uh, virus or anything like that, some kind of unclean thing in your life the blood covers it. The white blood cells cover it completely. The second thing it does is called degradation. It breaks them up into thousands and millions of tiny pieces. The third thing is consumption. Then it consumes the uncleanness or the bacteria or whatever it is. It completely consumes it. And now... Once those white blood cells have done their job, do you know what they do? They die. But what happens is, it is as if now you have never had that uncleanness in your life. Amen! I wish somebody was here to shout with me. Because that's how it works. This is what God does for us. He covers our sins completely. He takes them away from us and consumes them taking him upon himself, and then he died. And now, guess what? Now your body knows how to fight that off if it ever happens again. Because a record is kept of your enemies and your white blood cells now know how to fight this off. This is why once you catch certain diseases, and I think coronavirus could very well be one of those, once you catch that, you're, you're immune now. Your body knows how to fight it off. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to take a little break, refresh myself. We'll come back, sing some songs, preach the morning message. All right, Heavenly Father, I love you. Thank you for the blood. And Father, I pray for pastors who have fallen into error over this issue, who followed the corrupt teachings of men, Lord, who only seek to alter the word of God instead of just believing the word of God. And Father, we thank you for the blood and we thank you, Lord, that you help us fight our diseases, that you help us fight our infirmities, that you help us fight off the uncleanness that's in us, God. And that you wash us, just like white blood cells, you wash us white as snow. Thank you, Jesus. For offering up your own blood. I can never repay that. Never. But I seek to serve you all the days of my life. Because of what you've done for me. I love you. Bless your word we pray in Jesus name. And all of God's people said. Amen. Let's take a little break.